How will we communicate differently online in 2021? Let's make some predictions. Predictions. 2021 is shaping up to be a weird year. After the hell of 2020, we all want something better. But, for example, with the pandemic, we're not going to see real impact from the vaccination efforts that are starting around the world until later in the year. So it could be months before we feel anything like any form of normality returning. It may not be until 2022. We just don't know. So it's very hard to make plans. But whatever happens, we're probably going to be doing a lot more online communication this year. So it's worth looking at how that might shape up. Let's get predicting. Number one, more engaging online events. Online events were always going to become a bigger part of the events industry, but 2020 made it a necessity. The boom in online events was particularly great for UK startup Hopin, which lets organisers hold events remotely. It became a double unicorn with a $2.125 billion valuation. And it says it grew its annual recurring revenue from zero to $20 million in just nine months. 2021 is sure to be another big year for companies like Hopin, as travel and gatherings continue to be tightly restricted. But they do need to get better at replicating some of the reasons why people go to conferences. Confession. I find a lot of the content on stage at events pretty boring and pointless. I, I zone out, what can I say? Uh, a lot of the content you'll find on stage at conferences is things you could have read in blog posts six months ago, or on Twitter threads uh, nine months ago. So I find conferences a lot more valuable for the people you meet and the connections you make. The way platforms like Hopin have dealt with this to date is through things like speed dating style approaches where you're connected with somebody who might be tangentially linked to what you do and you might get some benefit from. So, uh, you know, if the algorithm for matching is quite good, it could end up pretty well. You could meet some interesting people. I heard good things about the Web Summit last year in November, the way they did it, but I'm still uncomfortable with doing that kind of networking because you're kind of sitting down there at home with your laptop and you're about to speak to somebody and you've got no idea who's going to pop up on the screen and then they pop up and you've got to talk to them for three minutes or whatever it is and you it might be great but it feels so forced and uncomfortable and flat if you know what I mean. I much prefer that kind of dynamic of you meet somebody while you're talking to somebody else uh, in the queue for food at the conference or you're just lining up to enter um, a conference room to listen to a speaker and the person in front of you uh, is looking at something on their phone and you go oh I, I know something about that or that's something I wrote or, or whatever and you start a conversation like that and you don't get that with these online platforms. It's kind of like a, a pale imitation. So there's a lot of work to be done around serendipity and networking. And more broadly, Hopin told TechCrunch that it wants to become a platform where other technologies can intersect with it. For example, with virtual reality. And if we do start to see in-person events start up again towards the end of the year, Hopin says that its true future is as a hybrid platform that makes taking part in an event wherever you are in the world almost as good as being there. Certainly good enough to pay for a ticket. And if we do see physical events start up again towards the end of the year, then I can imagine more of a hybrid approach becoming the norm for a lot of organisers. Why limit yourself to the people who can get to the room where you are? Now in the past, you might have been able to offer a, a pretty boring, unengaging live feed of what's going on on the stage, but if you can offer a much better integrated suite of uh, interactive opportunities that are pretty much equal whether you're in the room or remote, then there are some great opportunities for events organisers in cities around the world to expand their market, uh, both in terms of the audience they serve and maybe even the guests that they have speaking. Because I mean, if you think about, for example, uh, one that caught my eye recently was the Financial Times and TNW had an event where Justin Trudeau spoke, the Canadian Prime Minister. He spoke at an event based in Europe. And would he have normally done that? Well, if he was traveling to Europe and he happened to have some free time on that day and he was nearby, then maybe. 
but if he can record it in his office back in Canada and pre-record it even to deal with the time zone differences, then suddenly he's reached a new audience of Financial Times readers and that audience has heard from him and the organisers have had a really interesting new speaker. So there are lots of opportunities for the events industry as we come out of the pandemic. Prediction two, video calling tries to expand with limited success. Video calling and video meetings are something that a lot of us got very painfully used to in 2020. And I think we've all accepted that that's something that's going to be the norm for some time to come. Uh, the platforms improved their feature sets this year. We saw a lot more of things like virtual backgrounds and various other features to help make online video meetings a lot more interesting and useful. Uh, and we'll see more of that this year, but some of those new features might not get used as much as you'd think. It's easy to imagine that, mm-hmm, and tech like it that lets you visually spruce up the way you communicate on calls will become more widely available and more widely used. But many people simply won't bother with it. A straightforward video meeting is more than enough for many of us. Like Hopin, we'll see Zoom try to become more of a platform too. And a recent report by The Information said that Zoom is even looking at launching its own email and calendar apps. But I predict that those will struggle to take off, no matter how good they are. Let's face it, most businesses already have email and calendar sorted with somebody like Google or Microsoft, and they're not going to want to go to the effort of switching to Zoom, because it's a lot of effort if you're a big business to switch email and calendar providers. And... It's more in Zoom's interest that you switch than it is in a business's interests because of that high barrier to cross to go to something new. So I think that uh, those kinds of features from Zoom might be facing a bit of an uphill battle. Prediction three, less video calling, more asynchronous communication. As I've already said, we're not going to be doing less video calling than we did last year, but that doesn't necessarily mean we'll be doing more. One thing I hear a lot about is workers complaining that their working culture has become an endless stream of video meetings. Having managed online teams in the past, I can say that asynchronous communication is far more respectful of employees' time than having everybody go through these big long meetings for hours at a time, week after week after week. That's where apps like Loom and Supernormal come in, making it easy for team members to share video messages with colleagues. Why get stuck in an online meeting for an hour when only 10 minutes of that hour is relevant to your job, when you can watch a video from the person you needed to hear from on its own? Now, personally, I see products like Loom being used mainly by tech-focused teams at the moment, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think Zoom fatigue may well drive managers in companies around the world to look at asynchronous video as a really healthy alternative. And while we're at it, asynchronous text messaging about little queries here and there is far more respectful of people's time than making them schedule a call to answer a simple question. Everyone just needs to get in the habit of having Slack, Teams, or whatever else they use open, checking and responding to messages regularly. So look out for more asynchronous work communication in 2021. Prediction four, virtual worlds become useful. Now I come to this prediction with caution because virtual worlds as a next big thing have been something we've seen on predictions lists for a new year every year for I don't know how long. They seem to pop up all the time and they never really bear fruit. This year, the CEO of Roblox has predicted for Wired that this is the year of the metaverse, a 3D virtual world where millions meet online. That seems a bit overblown, but exactly in the interests of a company like Roblox, who could benefit from it. The metaverse is coming. Sounds like the kind of thing Wired likes to say as a grand statement years before something actually happens. But if you look carefully, you can see that it's actually kind of already happening. Fortnite 
is a metaverse of sorts, with young people meeting in its online world, not just to shoot each other while playing a game, but to just hang out with friends, to watch live music performances, and even to watch corporate propaganda from the company who makes Fortnite. And that sounds exactly like a virtual world being used for a range of purposes. The dream of Second Life finally bearing fruit. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see older generations dipping a toe into the world of a metaverse or just a, a virtual world. Uh, it kind of ties in with the idea of conferences offering more engaging experiences around networking. The question is whether these kinds of virtual worlds will take off properly before Generation Fortnite is old enough to start to want to go to business events. At that point, it may well be something that they expect and maybe even prefer to traditional events. Who knows? Uh, but I think this year we'll start to see some events dip their toe in the water and try some of these ideas out to see how it goes. An optional virtual world for attendees at this year's Web Summit, maybe? And prediction five. Moderation gets creative. The polarisation of online debate where people take increasingly extreme views about topics to the point where it's increasingly hard to find common ground is unlikely to be resolved this year. I really don't think that's going to be happening. In fact, I think that maybe online polarisation could cause a civil war in a major Western country in the next few years, but maybe not this year. Ha! You clearly recorded that before the storming of the Capitol in Washington DC recently, didn't you, Martin? Yes, you did, but the rest of this still stands well, even if a civil war seems a little more likely than it might have done a couple of weeks ago. But efforts to moderate the worst behaviour in online communication will see new approaches being trialled this year, as it becomes increasingly obvious that the traditional approaches uh, that companies like Facebook and Twitter and others have been taking for the last few years, even as they ramped up their efforts in 2020, haven't really been enough. I'm particularly interested in the approach Twitter is starting to take. Their senior product manager for conversational safety was recently quoted as saying, The point is not to make the entire world a safe space. That's not possible. The point is to empower people and communities to have the tools to heal harm themselves and to prevent harm to themselves and put them in control. This, Protocol reported, includes building tools that create private pathways for apologies, forgiveness and de-escalation. Imagine if a high-profile Twitter argument was diverted to direct messages where the two people at the centre of the debate, at the centre of the disagreement, could resolve their differences quietly and privately, rather than feeling like they had to noisily play up to their audience and their side in the argument. It probably wouldn't work sometimes, but if it works some of the time, it could well be worth trying. So I, I hope that Twitter will give that a go in the coming year. Uh, just like they gave a go at the idea of telling you to read an article before you shared it and promoting the idea of only using quote tweets rather than standard native retweets. That didn't work in the end. It didn't create more meaningful, thoughtful sharing at all. So Twitter dropped the idea and went back to the old traditional way of retweeting very quickly. But I like that they tried it and that they were open about what they learned from it. And so I hope we'll see more of that from Twitter this year. And it certainly seems that we will. Let's hope we see other social companies doing similar things. So there you go. Five predictions for online communication in 2021. Nothing too wild, but in my experience, the wilder the prediction, the more likely it is that it won't come true. So I'm kind of being sensible, and uh, I think that these predictions will stand up to scrutiny in 12 months' time. But hey, we'll see. If you've enjoyed this video, then please hit subscribe and the bell, and you'll be notified as soon as the next video goes live. And if you want more Big Revolution in your life, then why not subscribe to the newsletter and receive tech news and analysis and commentary six days a week in your inbox. Just go to bigrevolution.net slash newsletter and subscribe. That's all from me. I'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.